Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to our eighth already Atlas YouTube Live Talk. My name is Rebecca. I am a particle physicist at Atlas, and I'll be your host tonight. So for this uh, YouTube Live Talk tonight, we will follow the exact same format we've been following in the previous talks. So first, we will have the presentation, and then it will be followed by a Q&A session. Please do ask as many questions as you want in the chat here in the YouTube channel or also in our Instagram account. So you can find all of these details in, in the YouTube page of our channel. So with this, is, yes, we can start. So it's a pleasure for me to introduce tonight the Dr. Heather Russell. So <laughs> Dr. Russell is an assistant professor at the University of Victoria in Canada. So it's not evening for her, it's for me that I'm at certain time. So she's been a member of the Atlas Collaboration since 2012. Her research focuses on measuring rare standard model processes that involve interactions of fourth gauge bosons. She also works on the design and implementation of the Atlas trigger software. And this is exactly what she's going to tell us about today. So we're going to hear about the trigger system that is one of the most vital parts of Atlas. So Heather, whenever you want, go ahead. Let me share the correct window. <laughs> And I think we're ready to go. So yeah, thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, today, I'm going to talk about basically the how and why we can't save every particle collision the LHC produces. Let me just get my laser pointer ready here so I can select things, there we go. Okay, so um, before that, I'm just gonna say a little bit of an overview. So I'm a member of the Atlas Collaboration and we're a global collaboration of around 3000 people from nearly 200 different universities and labs. So nothing I'm talking about today is solely my work, but really the work of a huge number of people. Um, and we study particle collisions inside the Atlas detector, that is this one, um, at the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, which is just located outside Geneva in Switzerland. But before we jump into some of the details and all of the little complicated physics parts, we're gonna start with a little bit of a thought experiment. So imagine you're walking down the street, minding your own business when you come across a donut collider. You really like donuts, so this is a very good day. You, but you haven't even finished eating your first donut yet when another one comes. That's okay, you are almost done and a second donut does sound pretty awesome. You can finish the first in time and then eat the second. But no sooner than you wolf down your second donut and you're feeling just a little nauseous, do more donuts come? And this time they're coming faster. Now, you know you can't eat them in time, but it would be a shame for all of the donuts to go to waste. So just in time, you come up with a great solution. You summon a box to save the donuts for later. Now, they're coming at a reasonable enough speed that you can just put them all in as they come. And the box seems pretty big and empty right now. So you don't need to really pay much attention to what you're tossing in the box. There's room for everything. However, along the way, you do start to notice that some of the donuts aren't really very good. They haven't even been cooked at all. So in order to make sure you don't fill up your box with donuts you're never gonna eat, you reject these dough blobs off to the side and only keep the nice cooked donuts. Now, you do notice that some of them don't have sprinkles or are missing holes, but I mean, they're still donuts, so you might as well keep them while you have space. But then the donuts start coming way faster. You cannot keep up with putting them all in the box, let alone sorting out the bad ones. Uh, but donuts are pretty important to keep for later, I mean, otherwise you don't have any donuts later. So you do come up with a clever plan. You build a wall in front with a donut shaped hole that can sort out all of the blobby dough, bit, dough bits from the good donuts. Now, occasionally the odd cooked donut might not make it through, it'll just fall down, but overall it does a pretty darn good job. And now with all of these dough blobs um, sort of automatically taken care of, you can spend some time making educated decisions about some of the more abnormal donuts. I mean, you really prefer donuts with holes, but maybe some of the ones that have no hole are actually jelly filled. That would be a pretty awesome discovery, but you can't keep all of the ones without holes. Your box is getting full and you don't have time to like take a bite out of each to find out as they're coming in. Besides the fact you're already pretty full, but 
when those wholeless donuts come through and they're a little heavier than normal, you'll toss them in the box for further analysis and just reject the lighter ones off the side. So there's a higher chance of what you selected is actually the type you want. Now, what we've sort of designed here rather intuitively is a donut acquisition system to handle the high rate of donuts coming out of our donut collider. The first stage decides whether or not we keep the donut. If both selections pass, um, it triggers the saving of the donut, triggers the hand to put the donut in the box um, rather than tossing it away. There are two stages to this trigger system. The first one we're going to call level one. The level one decision happens very fast. It has to keep up with a high pace of donuts. The system is very efficient. It's not flexible though, but we make sure it doesn't reject any potentially good donuts. Sometimes the occasional roundish dough blob might make it through, but we can always sort that out later. The key is that we're not losing potentially good donuts before we've even gotten them in our hand. But the most important part is that it limits the number getting through to the high level decision making. So here with the high level decision, we can perform far more complicated decision making. It is slower, though far more precise. For example, here we have an advanced neural network. Um, but the key is that it only keeps the best donuts for further study, so the saver and the storage are not overwhelmed. Now, the donut saver is just your arm. It takes the donut from the bean and it puts it in the box for later. Um, it has to keep up with the donuts as they're accepted by our high-level decision-making. If we don't keep up, then we're not ready to catch the next donut and we end up losing potential deliciousness. And then the last part of the system is our donut storage. Now, this isn't really part of our acquisition system because at this point, the donuts have been acquired, but it is the end of the chain. Here, we can keep the donuts safe for later study. For instance, when you're no longer being pelted with donuts, you could sit down and do a detailed analysis of which ones might magically be jelly filled. Of course, um, <laughs> we can't use donut colliders to probe the standard model. And I think I've probably taken that analogy far enough. I did promise you something about particle physics. So for this, we need something just a little bit bigger. And we use the Large Hadron Collider, or the LHC. Now, the LHC is a giant ring uh, about 100 meters underground and 27 kilometers in circumference that accelerates protons to very fast speeds. It gives them lots of kinetic energy and then collides them in four separate points along the ring. ATLAS, that's the experiment I work on. Oh, my pointer's not, the right. experiment I work on um, is right here along the ring and it's in the middle. So at the LHC, right, we're colliding mainly protons at very, very high energies. And we're using, right, the giant LHC ring to make them go 99.999999, there's six nines at this percent of the speed of light. And then we smash them into each other. Now, when these protons collide, it's actually the quarks and gluons inside the proton that are colliding, not the whole protons themselves. And when this happens, they undergo what we call inelastic collisions. So they don't just bounce off each other, but their energy, remember, they have lots of this in the form of kinetic energy because they're going very fast. This energy can turn into new particles like top quarks or Higgs bosons, or maybe even some mysterious particle X that could explain dark matter. It's basically the microscopic version of saying we threw two donuts together and got out a th three tiered birthday cake. That would be pretty awesome. Unfortunately, we can't do that with our donut collider, but we can make Higgs bosons with protons. Now, when the quarks or gluons inelastically interact, the new particles that we can detect are things such as muons, electrons, photons, or something we call jets. And the way we do this is with our giant particle camera. This is the ATLAS detector. Now, ATLAS is around 25 meters tall and 44 meters long. Now, I know this sounds decently big. Meters are kind of big and 25 is a big number, but just to emphasize the size, this fully grown T-Rex is actually to scale. Now, we can't take pictures of all types of particles in exactly the same way. So there are lots of different parts to the detector. It's probably a bit overwhelming to look at them all at once here but I'm going to highlight the most relevant ones in the next few slides. So at the center of Atlas is what we call the inner detector because, well, it's the innermost part of our detector. Um, and the inner detector helps us see the paths of charged particles like electrons or muons. 
Next up, surrounding the inner detector, are the calorimeters. The calorimeters basically absorb the energy from electrons, photons, and particles made up of quarks and gluons, we call these hadrons, and it tells us how much energy they have. Last, on the outside of Atlas, are the muon detectors. Now, muons don't interact very much with any sort of material, so we can't absorb their energy to measure them like we do with electrons. Instead, we have big muon detectors that can tell us where the muons traversed. And with the help of very strong magnets, this also provides the momentum of the muons. We know how much energy they had. So to summarize how these particles usually show up in our giant particle camera, a muon leaves a track in both the inner detector and in the muon detectors, and doesn't do much of anything in the calorimeters. Electrons and photons, they both have their energy absorbed in the first few layers of the calorimeters. And we can distinguish electrons from photons because electrons are charged particles um, and they leave then a track in the inner detector, whereas a photon won't. And then when we produce a quark or a gluon in the collision, um, because of something called confinement and the strong force, we end up with a big shower of hadrons. So we generally get lots and lots of tracks from hadrons in the inner detector, and then the energy of the hadrons are gradually absorbed as they fly through the calorimeters. Now, some of you might be thinking back in your mind, well, I've heard of all sorts of other particles and you haven't mentioned any of those at all. It's rather suspicious. And that's true. I, I did leave a huge number of particles out. Um, and that's because we don't observe these directly. We know these particles exist in the standard model, but they're unstable. So they decay far, far faster than we can ever hope to possibly detect them actually traveling through the detector. And so then what we see in Atlas are the particles that they decay into, like where we observed the Higgs boson for the first time through its decay into two photons. We saw the photons, not a Higgs boson energy blob. Of course, nothing's ever quite that easy. Um, we don't just see little muons alone and say, yay, we found a Higgs. Um, I kind of, so I kind of lied. Um, also before, we don't just collide single protons. Um, we collide big bunches of protons. And I say big, I mean really big bunches. This is because the protons are so small compared to the accuracy of the collider itself that most of the time they just fly right past each other. They, or they'll interact elastically, they sort of bounce off. That's not what we want to study, most of us. Um, or they'll have just a teeny little bit of a collision, which also isn't producing fun things like Higgs bosons. Now, a fun fact for you here, 10 to the 11 protons sounds like a lot. I mean, it, it is a lot. It's 100 billion protons. Um, and we actually have 2,500 bunches of these circulating around the LHC ring when we're doing collisions. So we have 100 billion times 2,500 bunches. I'm not going to try to do that math in my head because I'll get it wrong, but it's a lot of protons. Um, but it turns out that protons, of course, are really, really small. And a single commercial five kilogram cylinder of hydrogen gas has enough protons to run the LHC for over a billion years. Um, unfortunately, we would need better cylinders first because the hydrogen would actually diffuse out of the bottle faster than we could use it all. So we are colliding a huge number of protons, but when you actually look at it, it's a very small amount of, of hydrogen. Now, back to our proton bunches. Um, these are spaced around the ring. So we have those 2,500 bunches spaced around the ring um, when we're running, such that two bunches will collide every 25 nanoseconds, pretty darn frequently. Um, there are some gaps, though, where the filling process, when we're you know, putting them into the ring, actually just needs to take a bit of a breather before continuing with filling. So there are some 25 nanoseconds and then a bunch of gaps and then more 25 nanoseconds spacing. So on average, our bunches are colliding at a rate of 30 megahertz. That's 30 million bunches colliding per second. Since there are so many protons per bunch, right, 10 to the 11, big numbers, um, we actually get about 36 unique collisions each time a bunch, two bunches collide. This might seem hard to deal with, like how do you keep track of which one, what came from where, and they don't, do they mix? Um, but it's okay. Um, it's actually a good thing because most of these collisions are not very exciting. And the more collisions we, we get, the higher chance we have of actually producing really rare particles. Now, the, of these 30 million bunch crossings per second, we only end up choosing a really tiny fraction, just 1,500 to record for later study. And we do try to select the most interesting ones, though, of course, that is rather subjective what interesting is. And just to give some perspective for these huge rates, some exciting 
really rare process, processes that we're interested in. For example, this would be a Higgs boson decaying into two muons. Um, these happen only around once a day or even less. So we really do need to run for a lot of days to collect these events. For the remainder of this talk, what I'm going to focus on is this yellow box. I didn't give you too much detail a second ago, but there's a huge amount that goes into this. What is, how many words is that? Our eight word statement. So how do we choose each second which 1500 of 30 million collisions we're going to record? And I don't just mean how, as in debating which exciting things we're going to record, but how do we even manage this from a technical perspective? But Okay, so you say, fine, <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to do, but to make all these decisions, why, why did we do that? Why bother? If, if having 30 million bunches colliding per second each with 36 proton-proton collisions is so hard to deal with, why? But it's, it's really a double-edged sword. So on one hand, if we have lots of collisions, we have a huge rate of data to cope with and we have to deal with that. But on the other hand, if we did have fewer collisions, there would be a much lower chance of interesting collisions happening. And our sort of whole raison d'etre is interesting collisions happening. This is what we want. So we, in the end, right, we go for the lots of collisions route and then do our best to cope with the demands on our system. Or maybe you weren't thinking, okay, just take less collisions. You're saying, well, there's lots of them. Why don't you just take them all? Um, rather than say filtering in real time and trying to figure out which 1500 are best, save them all, deal with it later. Uh, so each collision itself is about one megabyte when we save it to disk. So consider a laptop with around one terabyte of storage. That might be wishful thinking. I know it's 10 times more than my laptop has. It's a pretty big hard drive. This is a good laptop. Um, this could store 1 million collisions. That sounds like a lot, but if we're not filtering anything, we would fill that up in a 30th of a second. But okay, laptops are small compared to say data centers. Um, we can make a fair comparison. I don't obviously... If we're taking lots of data, we're not going to just have a laptop, we're going to have a big server room. Um, now, in 2016, and this is the most recent number I could find, all of Facebook's data, everything it had, was around 300 petabytes. That would fit around 300 billion collisions. Now, that's again, sounds like a huge number, but that's only three hours of data. Now, even if we think that Facebook has doubled its data each year, so from 2016, we're still talking less than a week of collisions if we wiped all of Facebook's data and all of their data centers and replaced it with Atlas collisions. Um, then, of course, if we, even if we did that, it would be the problem of trying to process all that. How do you actually filter through and find the events you're looking for, the interesting stuff? Instead of kind of looking for the Higgs boson in a haystack, you'd be searching for the Higgs in the entirety of central Canada. You'd never find it. It would be impossible. So we don't go down that route. Then, of course, the pressing question we have to answer is, how do we decide what types of events we're going to save? Um, and to answer this, we really need to think about the physics goals of Atlas. What do we want to do with these collisions? And I think there's sort of three categories of the things we want to study or the things, the reasons we save events for future study. First off, there's the things we know exist and want to study further or confirm the existence of. These are our standard model processes. They're things that the standard model predicts um, and take the form of things like measurements of Higgs boson decays to standard model particles, like the Higgs boson decaying to two photons, um, precisely measuring the mass of the W boson, or trying to observe very rare standard model processes that we know should exist, but haven't quite managed to see yet. That's personally what I do. Um, then there are things that we've thought of that might exist that we specifically want to search for. These are kind of our known unknowns. They're things like supersymmetry, um, wimp dark matter, that's what falls into this category. Then <laughs> there's lastly, I think it's the hardest bit. These are unknown unknowns. These are the things we haven't thought of yet, but might want to look for in the future. And when we take these collisions, they only come you know, basically once. So we want to make sure we do our very best so that when people think up new theories to explain some of the holes in the standard model, We've recorded a set of events that we can still look for that in, even though we didn't know it was even predicted yet, hadn't been thought of yet, we can still look for it. Now, I've made all of these boxes the same size. That's just for the sake of my explanations and being able to actually read the text out. Um, but really, it's more like this, right? There are so many possibilities that we haven't thought of yet. 
um, then one of the hardest parts of designing our event selection is making sure that it's generic enough such that we do not exclude any particle X that could be hiding way beyond the things we've thought of just waiting to be discovered. Now, I'm gonna give you an example of the two things. I can't give an example of a thing we don't know, we haven't thought of yet because we haven't thought of it yet. But I'll give an example of, uh, for instance here, something that we think exists that we're um, trying to measure. This is this rare standard model process that you know everything says should exist, but we haven't quite confirmed yet. Um, and this is the one I've talked about a few times already, the decay of a Higgs boson into two muons. So it looks like this in our detector, right? There's two muon tracks that interact with our muon detector and not much else there. So when we want to save these events, we design our trigger system to keep events you know, with a, a muon or with two muons to make sure that we can study them later, such as events like this one recorded in 2015. Other types of events um, we want to, to make sure we keep are, for instance, events with one single very high energy jet. So it's like a very high energy quark or gluon that turned into a shower of particles. Um, and these are a type of event we search for evidence of dark matter in. So you can see just you know, looking back and forth between these that they're very different types of events we need to make sure we, we keep. So I think we've pretty well defined the problem at this point. Right. To summarize, our trigger system needs to, one, be able to cope with 30 megahertz collision input rates, be able to identify vastly different types of particles and different types of events, and decide which small fraction of events that we want to save to disk. Now, all of this is done not just by a system itself with vast amounts of expert human input. And luckily, none of this comes as a surprise. Right, Everything here was taken into account when we designed the Atlas detector and data acquisition system itself um, you know, well over 20 years ago. Now, speaking of the Atlas trigger and data acquisition system, um, this is a technical schematic of that. Um, it's a bit complicated, so we're not gonna go into it in any detail. Um, and don't worry, I've simplified it for you. Uh, this is still a little complicated, obviously, to look at all at once. Um, so we're gonna go through it in chunks. Um, we're going to start here with the first of the two trigger systems. It's just like our donut collider. We have a level one system and a high level system. Now, within the level one trigger, Atlas has actually two main systems. One is for the calorimeters, which can be used to select events with calorimeter activity. Remember, like electrons, photons, uh, or jets. Um, it can also do like an overall just lots of stuff in the detector or an imbalance of lots of stuff, lots of stuff on one side, but nothing on the other, kind of like that dark matter candidate event we just saw. Now, the other system is for muons. These are separate simply because the calculations they must do are really quite different and use input data for different parts of the detector. But of course, we do have the ability then to combine information um, from both using what we call a topological trigger. So you can see that's here and both systems feed in. Here we can, for instance, calculate the angular distance between two objects like a muon and a photon. And all of the information from these three different level one systems is combined in what we call our central trigger processor, which based on what was in all of the types of events, we've told, we, the, based on the objects in the event that's happened, and all of the things we've told the trigger we want to save, it's like, I want events that have muons in them so I can study Higgs. Um, it'll go, oh, this event has a muon and save it out to the high level trigger. Um, now we can only send a maximum rate of 100 kilohertz. So 100,000 events per second from the level one central trigger to the high level trigger. So the level one system really does a huge amount of heavy lifting. It takes us from our 30 million collisions down to 100,000. Um, now, all of the, the electronics for these systems are actually located underground. They're in um, this room here off to the side where the detectors, you can see in the central big chamber here, and then all of these electronics are underground very close to the detector. And that's a very important thing to happen because the one of the most important design specifications of our levels one system is that the decision must be made and transferred to the high level trigger in 2.5 microseconds. Um, and this is a sort of a hard cut. If we don't make it, we can't save the event. Now, because all of the level one 
trigger system is custom built electronics. We tend to call it hardware triggers. Now, these are still computers, but they're very specially designed computers. So instead of just buying a laptop or even a high performance server um, and taking that off the shelf and just running some code on it, we actually design circuit boards to do exactly the thing we want them to do. And in doing this, we end up with something that does a very limited number of things. It can only do that thing we built it to do, but it does it very well. And most importantly, it does it very, very fast. So this picture on the left uh, shows one of 24 electron feature extractor boards. So it just um, is one of 24 boards that we have for different parts of the detector that says, are there electron-like objects in this part of the detector? The four spiky orange bits um, are processor FPGAs. So these, the spiky orange bits aren't the processor themselves. These are actually copper heat sinks. And then the large black bit on the right here is a control FPGA. Now, FPGAs stands for Field Program Pro Programmable Gate Arrays. And what that means, it's just some hardware that is programmable by us after we buy it. So it doesn't come totally set. It's mostly set, but we can change a little bit about what it does after. Um, and this is important because, for one, we can program this to do exactly what we want it to do, um, but it's also a little more flexible. So if we need to change it a little after, you know, for instance, we, we designed the board, we can do that. If we come up with a new idea or if somebody predicts a new type of particle that we weren't saving in our system, we can change it on the fly. Well, not quite on the fly. We can change it and make sure that we select those for later. Um, this is a little slower than designing a chip that actually does exactly the thing we want. That would be like an ASIC, but the compromise is definitely worth it. Now, the reason these go a lot faster than say a normal computer is inside like your laptop or something, you have all these commercial chips, the commercial processors, you can optimize your software, but the processors themselves are fixed. And because they're multi-purpose, they have to be able to do everything, which means that they're not optimized or very fast for anything in particular. So that's why we go for very custom hardware. Um, we can take a closer look at the level one calorimeter trigger system itself, because you know I just talked about electrons. There's a whole bunch of different types of objects that we want to get from the calorimeters, and electrons are only one of them. Um, now, the first step of actually making this isn't finding the electrons, but taking the data off of the detector and sending it to the boards. And we can't send information from every single detector cell. That's, it's just far too much. We, we, we <laughs> don't really have enough cables to plug and to send it all. It just wouldn't work. So we have to reduce the calorimeter data from information from every individual channel to something a lot coarser. Now, how coarse exactly determines how precise we can be in our trigger selection. The more detailed information we send in, of course, the more detailed, precise objects we can get out. There's a bit of a compromise there. How much time do we spend making objects um, versus how much time do we spend finding them, right? Because remember, we're very limited in the amount of time we have to make this decision. So speaking of speed, right, we have three different types of boards for different purposes. And remember that I said if we make our electronics do one thing very well, it'll do that thing faster. So that's why we have different boards basically for dis different systems or for different calculations. Um, we have one that makes electrons, finds electrons and photons, one that would find things like jets, and another one that calculates total energy in the event and the global detector. And these are different calculations. We have them on different boards to make sure that everything gets done within our limited latency. Now, the other system these both feed into, or this, the calorimeter trigger all does, and the muon trigger is our level one topological trigger. And what this does, for example, is here, this is our, I'm going to show this event display again and again. Um, this is an example of an event that looks like a Higgs boson decaying to two muons. And these muons are pretty close together, but what if I only wanted muons that were far apart? Not like this one, but ones that were, you know, pointing back to back we could actually perform a topological calculation. So we could calculate right, the angle between the muons. Um, or for instance, maybe I wanted a muon and an electron back to back. I could calculate the angle between those. And that would allow me to even level one say, never save these types of events. That's just a waste of our precious 100 kilohertz, only save this type. And that helps us reduce the rate even more 
and make sure we're really targeting the type of physics we want. Now, the high level trigger is where, of course, this 100,000 events per second goes. Um, this gets information from the level one system about what type of event we have. Um, and then with that goes, okay, let's see if, if those objects, the level one, because it's quite coarse, it's quite fast, objects it suggests might be there actually are. Um, for example, um, the level one system might say, this event has an electron, or I think this event has an electron, or here's 100,000 of events that might have an electron, and the high level trigger processes all of those and says, okay, 100,000 didn't, but these 50 really did, we'll save these out to disk. And the way we do that is on a giant farm. So it's around 100,000 commercial CPU cores. So, you know, if each processor has eight cores, right? It's not that many processors, but 100,000 cores located on the surface above Atlas detector, just in a, in a room above the detector. Um, with, of course, lots and lots of cables coming to it from the detector to get the information back and forth. Because it happens on commercial uh, infrastructure, we call this a software trigger because the thing we write here is code, it's software. Um, mostly it's C++ um, with some configuration in Python and some of the tools we have are, are in Java. And 100,000 cores sounds like a lot, but keep in mind, we need to process events at 100 kilohertz. I've just noticed these numbers are actually the same, right? 100,000 events per second and 100,000 cores. You can see, you know, even there, it's, it's saying we have to be able to decide on this event in a second, which generally we can. Um, and that's just, we need to be able to, to get through these events as fast as humanly or technologically possible. So all of the standard, the trigger software we use, all of the code we've written, this is stored actually just in a big GitLab repository. Um, it's sort of just like any other big programs that, that you might see online. Um, and it takes detector hits in and calculates all of the physics objects they correspond to and sends those out or makes decisions on them out. So you send it lots and lots of calorimeter information and it says, I had three electrons. Um, it's all public if you're really curious. That's certainly not how I would spend my spare time, but it's publicly available on GitLab if you wanna see what I mean when I say trigger software. Now in the high level trigger and the actual code itself, what we use is multi-step decision-making. And, um, and this is to make sure we have early rejection for optimal processing speed. We do have 100,000 cores, but we want to use these in the most efficient way possible. We don't want to waste our time calculating things we don't need because the event has some other characteristic that you know, already means we know it'll never pass our selection to save. Um, and the way we do this is just iterating between algorithms, so calculating something and then hypothesis testing, seeing if that something is good enough. So for instance, it's like making something really fast and then seeing if it's good enough. Okay, if it's good enough, we carry on. If it's not, we just toss that event, we stop. We don't keep going. But some of them will be good enough. So then we go and we'll go, okay. It was, it was okay, there was maybe something there, but let's check again. Let's make it better. We'll run some slightly slower code that does a better job and see if the thing is still there. So made a better thing and then we can check again. Is this thing still good enough? And if it is, we might write it out to disk. And if it's not, then we reject. And in this way, like on each hypothesis, we're reducing the rate we're processing. So we never do things we don't have to. And that helps us use our 100,000 cores as optimally as we can. And you know, allows us to, for instance, come up with some really clever, fun things. If we can do everything as fast as possible, occasionally you know, we'll be able to put some neat reconstruction on and make something maybe that might be a little too slow otherwise. Now, an example of this, if I've lost everyone is, Let's take it back to our donuts, right? If you wanted donuts with a hole with at least 10 sprinkles, you wouldn't count the sprinkles on all of the donuts, right? First, you'd check if the donut had a hole. Um, and if it didn't have a hole, you wouldn't even bother counting. You just toss it aside. That was very fast, right? Um, the next step is you look at it. Okay, it's got a hole. That's pretty good. It has a few sprinkles. But you can do a pretty good estimation by eye if it has something like 10, or really it's more like two or three. So you do a really quick glance and be like, oh yeah, these ones aren't even gonna, there's no way that's close to 10, but only once they reach a certain threshold-ish um, would you bother counting. And that's gonna be a rough number that's doing something quickly, 
And you have to be a little loose in your requirements, right? You don't want to estimate with your eyes 10. You'd maybe estimate, is it around five and toss out everything less than five? Only then do you do the slow thing, sitting down and counting exactly how many sprinkles there are on the donuts. And then you do a hypothesis test to see if that was number was greater than 10. Okay. So that's what the high level trigger essentially does. Um, and I just want to talk for a minute about this innocent looking arrow here. Um, now, this, this here is basically the detector readout and aggregation and sending information, for instance, to the high level trigger or even this full detector information out to data storage once we've accepted the events by the trigger. And I've, I've removed a lot of detail here and a lot of cross arrow information, but basically what's happening um, is a lot of the limitations in our system comes from this you know, box I've drawn. Now, when the level one trigger accepts an event, right, we have up to 2.5 microseconds after the collision happened to do this. And that's because of what's in this box, basically. So if we do that 2.5 microseconds later, all of the detector information for that event must still be somewhere so that the high level trigger has something to process, right? If we take 2.5 microseconds to decide and the level one says, yeah, let's keep that. We have to be able to have that event still to write out, right? Because the level one just processed some really coarse information. It didn't process, we never took the whole event off the detector. Now, the temporary storage of this data happens on what we call front end electronics on the detector itself. Um, and this is because there's just too much data to take it all off the detector right away. We can't do that. There's just way too much of it. Um, but this actually having electronics on the detector is one of the fundamental limitations of our entire system. And that's because when we keep detect information on the detector, we're storing it in a high radiation environment and we need super special electronics to actually keep it there. So we're limited in how many collisions we can store before we have to start throwing them away, right? If the level one decision doesn't come within that two and a half microseconds, it's gone, right? Even if it says, keep this event, it was amazing. It might've had new particles in it. If it took three microseconds, that's too bad. We can't do that. So it has to be fast. Um, and that's just because we, you know, we can't hook up you know, normal memory, normal hard drive to detectors. When you're in a high radiation environment, the radiation is going to cause things we call like single event upsets and just destroy the, uh, the electronics before we can actually pull the data off them. Now, let's go back and we're going to talk about uh, how we choose which events we're going to select. So I think we have sort of an understanding of the trigger system now. What do we do with it? So most particles are produced at fairly low energies. When you have a collision, most of the time, nothing super interesting happens. Now, this plot is pretty old, but I think it still illustrates the point pretty well, is it shows the probability that a muon is going to be produced as a function of this momentum. And you don't need to look at all of the, all of the curves and all of the axis labels or anything, but it says that really low momentum muons have a super high probability and high momentum muons have a low probability. Um, so what this tells us is that if we only select high momentum particles, like high energy particles, um, we're going to select particles at a fairly low rate. So if we want our trigger rate to be low, we should make our thresholds really high. Now, luckily for us, um, we're mostly interested in the high end of the spectrum where there's low rate. And this is because like older pre-LHC experiments have already studied the low energy end in a hu huge amount of detail. So this down here, these are things that, for instance, um, the predecessor to the LHC LEP could have studied. That's not why we exist. We exist to study this stuff. Um, now, the numbers on the previous page, um, that was like the probability that something happens, but this converts pretty linearly into an actual rate in the, the detector or a trigger rate. Um, so these are approximate rates you know, from run to from our real data that we took in 2018. Um, and they show you know, the rate at which the level one system would have accepted events if we'd made a specific muon momentum threshold requirement. So basically, if, if we said, I want, if I said, I want to save every single muon that has at least four GeV of momentum, it's just a unit we use to measure energy as four momentums, <laughs> doesn't matter on the exact unit for, for our explanatory purposes. Um, but if it has four, then that rate would be 2000 kilohertz. And I'm not sure if you remember the number, but I bought it here just in case the maximum total output rate we can use is 100 kilohertz. So we can't do that. We can't write them all out. 
um, we can't send them all to the high level sugar. If we instead increase that to six, we're up to 500, down, well, down to 500 uh, kilohertz, still far too high. Even at 10 GeV, we're still 200. And it's not until we get, for instance, to, to 15 GeV, do we get to the point at which we could even feasibly uh, accept all of these muons. But at this point, we're looking at 40 kilohertz. So you're saying that if we did that, it would mean almost half of the events we wrote out were muon events. Um, now, not everyone in the collaboration, remember, we're 3,000 people doing many different things. Not everyone wants muon events. So we can't be that greedy with muons. We have to share. Um, we do What we do is, is we pass all of these ones that have a 20 GeV threshold. We send all of those um, with at least a 20 GeV muon at level one into the high level trigger for further processing. Um, and that's because these events do end up being important for a huge number of analyses. And we've decided as a collaboration that it's worth dedicating a full 16 kilohertz of level one rate to them. So 16% of basically of our level one rate is events with one high momentum new one. Now, the other side of this, we have, you know, talking about rate, right? We can't accept super low energy things because they would be way too high rate to output. The other side of this is the signal efficiency. So if you have some desired signal where all of your leptons um, are super low momentum, say if they were all down here, um, you would need a really low threshold on your trigger to be able to save those events, right? If all of your muons in your, your signal, you were searching for some new physics that said all of my muons are four, right? Four GeV, um, we can't do that because that would be an output rate of 2000 kilohertz, which of course we can't do. Um, but most of the time, that's not what happens. So we usually have something that looks vaguely like this curve, right? There's some fraction of events will have some small momentum. There'll be some peak, and then it'll turn over, and you'll have some tail of high momentum particles. And choosing a threshold for your trigger is a balance between the rate you get online and the efficiency of selecting what your signal is. So in the ideal case, right, you'd have some some selection down here where you keep all of the signal right you get events where your your momentum of your muons is here and here and here and here and we save them all um, but that's too high we can't do that um, maybe from a rate perspective you want to keep the rates really low so we don't overwhelm the system um, so you want to put the cut here um, right but then you're only getting the small fraction of events and that's pretty inefficient right you're never going to find something or you're not going to be able to measure it if you can't save the events you want so usually what we end up with is something in the middle and that's some compromise between the rate and the actual signal efficiency. Now, many events, act, many analyses, sorry, many measurements and searches, they overlap in their desired events and can therefore use events with the same trigger selection. Um, now, what I mean by that is, for instance, if I wanted to do a measurement that only needed these mu ones, um, and then somebody else did a measurement that only wanted these ones, Right? We could, using our system, select just those little strips of the spectrum. Um, but instead of having two different triggers with only specific requirements, we try to be a little more inclusive and generic. So instead, we select everything from the minimum up, provided we can within our rate constraints. And in this sense, we're having a more generic trigger. So if somebody comes along later and wants to search in the middle, where, where we wouldn't have otherwise been looking, we can still do that. So we don't exclude necessarily things we haven't started looking for yet. Um, we don't over-specify as best we can. Now, with all of this together with understanding now the system and our efficiencies, um, we can put a trigger selection together. So most triggers have the, the sort of the following, following structure. We start with our collision, right? It sends something in, um, and then we have a level one selection that feeds directly into some high level trigger selection. Um, and then if it passes, we send the uh, event out to disk, right? At each step here, right, the selection gets more stringent and the rate of events gets lower. So what way we do that is with an object selection plus some criteria at both the level one and the high level systems. And together, this makes up a trigger selection for a specific type of process. For example, if I want to select a photon, I would tell the system what I wanted the energy to be, um, how photony I wanted the photon to be. For instance, 
If I knew that my signal produced photons that were really, really, really like photons, I would say, let's select events that are really, really, really like photons. But maybe my signal's not quite that, that specific and they're not the best photons in my signal. There tends to be lots of other particles around them. I'm gonna have like maybe a photon are the events I want to select. So we can actually define that in our trigger selection. And then the other thing we can do is say, how many of them do we want for each criteria? So let's uh, give some specific examples to what I mean here with some of the events we've already looked at. So going back to this event display we saw before, if we wanted to search for a visible dark matter that's produced alongside a jet, we could trigger the event, we could select the event, these types of events by looking for very high energy jets. So in our level one selection, we would say, I want one high energy jet, very high energy jet. And in the high level trigger, I would ask for one very high energy jet. Um, that's quite a simple event. There's not too much crowding it, which is why I started there. But for instance, if instead we wanted to select events with a Higgs boson decaying to two photons, um, we can do at level one, for instance, is there just a photon? We could do that. But that would probably be pretty high rates. So instead, we know there's two photons in every event because the Higgs boson decays to two photons. And we're going to need those two photons to look for the Higgs offline when we do our analysis. So we want them in the trigger as well. Um, so we can say at level one, let's make sure there's two photons, both with some reasonable energy, because we know when the Higgs boson decays, it gives reasonable energy photons. And at the high level trigger, we can do the same thing. We ask for two reasonable energy photons. But then if you notice, and I said talking before about photons being really photony or kind of not great, here, they're really photony. These are very good photons. There's no stuff around them. So we can say they're isolated from all sorts of other activity. And in that sense, we're only keeping the best events and the rate's a little lower. Uh, now, this event has two objects. You could also think, what else could we add? Um, and this is a bit of a loaded question. Um, and the reason is we could add some things, right? We know that these two photons came from the Higgs boson. We've discovered it. We know the mass of the Higgs boson. And we have this level one topological trigger that can calculate the mass of two particles. Um, so we could calculate at level one, for instance, the invariant mass of the particle this came from and say only keep the event if it comes from something that could be a Higgs. And then we'd only keep a small mass window of our spectrum. But there's two problems here. One, um, that is quite specific. So then if somebody wanted to look for a, a Higgs-like boson, something that wasn't quite the Higgs, but maybe is beyond the standard model that explains some, some problems with the standard model, um, they wouldn't be able to because we never saved those events. And the other problem is that we would have a very time, hard time estimating the background to our analysis. Um, so when we do, for instance, uh, a Higgs boson search for two photons, most of the events that would, we would get within that little mass window aren't Higgs bosons. They're other stuff. They're, you know, our, our haystack. So here, right, if we overspecify, we can't actually do our analysis. Uh, and that's something we always have to keep in mind when we're designing our trigger selection is it can't be too specific um, because you don't just want to keep your signal. You need to keep a broad enough cat categorization of events to be able to look for what you're looking for, what you want to look for. So those are some individual triggers. And then the last thing we have to do is go from everybody in the collaboration wanting their own individual analysis, or maybe we've grouped them all into people who want muons and people who want electrons. Um, and balance those. Um, and the combination of all of the different triggers we use and the rates we kind of let them have, we call this our menu. It's sort of the selection, we, the things we can choose from, right? And we're at our Atlas restaurant. Um, so a super easy you know, trigger menu, the very simplest thing we could do is not bother with any of this complicated stuff I talked about at all. Let's send 100 kilohertz of random events to the high level trigger and save 1.5 you know, kilohertz of random events to disk. It doesn't really help anybody search for much though, because as I pointed out many times, the most of the time when particles collide, nothing happens, nothing interesting happens. So we'd have a lot of nothing. We wouldn't be able to find very much. Something slightly harder, um, but still simple would be just saying, okay, we'll save electrons. Let's only save electrons. Um, but this would make people who, for instance, have only muons in their signature very sad. So what we do is <laughs> some, Thing that's you know way harder but achieves the full collaboration's physics goals and that's 
100 kilohertz at level one of a carefully curated balance of around 500 different level one selections, you do 500 different things with that level one system, different types of events. And then when we pass those to the high level trigger, we use around, it's, it's just ballpark, around a thousand different um, selections from the high level trigger to save you know, a thousand different types of events to disk for later study. Now, right, I said, so this is a set, the menu is the set of all level one and high level trigger selections. And we do end up with very complex selection, though many of the triggers are sort of slight modifications or supports for others. So we can really break it down to the nine categories listed in this plot. Now, if you look at the top purple band, that's this, this here, um, this represents the rate at which we write out data selected by all of the various electron triggers as, you know, as time goes on in the LHC runs. This is time when we're in a run on the x-axis. Um, and it's just saying basically that all of the electron triggers we have here is about, what is that, like 200, 300 kilohertz, sorry, 300 kilohertz, two, uh, 300 hertz of electron triggers. We dedicate that much to electrons. Um, the bottom band, the coral band here, is, is quite a lot. This is over 500 hertz. This is all the triggers that combine objects from different groups to make very, quite often, custom selections, um, generally for specific analyses. And these make up a huge part of the menu. You can see, right, we dedicate about 600 hertz to them. And the reason we do these is because by combining objects, we can lower the thresholds on each individual object meaning the signal efficiency will be higher. So for instance, if I have not just a single muon in the event, but a muon and an electron, I don't need to use 20 GeV muons at level one. I can say maybe a 10 GeV muon and a lower energy electron as well, and be a 10 GeV electron. And in that sense, I can keep signal events where my muon didn't meet that high energy threshold, but might meet the lower one. And now, just in case you're wondering, I should point it out and explain this plot a little. The reason the rates decay as a decrease as a function of time that we're in the run is basically because the number of protons in each bunch goes down throughout the run. The protons collide, they, they disappear from the bunches. Um, and it gets to the point where, you know, so you can see that the rate of interesting things happening is, is lower. It goes down and down um, until the LHC eventually decides it's not worth it to keep running. It dumps the beam, refills, and we start the whole process over again. Now, there's a huge number of things that I originally thought I could talk about today. Um, but as I put together these slides, I realized there just you know, wouldn't be time. And the one question I do want to end on is I think one of the most important ones is how do we know we did it right? Um, so first off, I say, well, we're very careful, right? We test again and again and again. And especially, you know, where there have been problems in the past, sort of known failure modes, we test specifically for those all the time. And before we deploy any trigger, so from testing to actually real data taking, we validate it on simulation of the events we want to select. We make sure it looks like it's doing the thing we're, we're telling it to do, or we think it's to do, and we test it on old data samples we've taken just to make sure everything looks okay. And then when we're actually taking the data, um, when the LHC is colliding bunches, we have people in the control room. Um, so just above Atlas, constantly comparing pre-designed control distributions and the rates of triggers to what we expect. And any time something looks even just a little bit off, there are experts who are contacted to advise on, on what should be done. Um, now, on top of that, I think one of the most convincing arguments for we've done it right is we've carefully measured a lot of standard model processes so here on the left, for instance, I have the simultaneous production of four leptons. So it's either four muons at a time, four electrons at a time, or two of each. And we've done this over a huge range of, of the uh, mass this, these could have come from. Um, so there's a whole bunch of different processes that take part. And you can see that from all the different colored lines or the regions here on the plot. And the most important thing, you know, to understand all the details here is that the prediction and the data agree very well. Right, so our measurements agree with what the simulations predict. So there's no indication that we've misselected our events. Um, and on the right, there's another example here of measurements that agree quite well with simulation. We have blue points from us, Atlas, 
and they agree well with, within their uh, uncertainties, their measurement uncertainties of the standard model parameter value, that's actually one, that dashed line. But also you see here data points from CMS. This is the one of the other uh, multi-purpose experiments at the LHC across the ring from us. Um, they're also looking at the same proton or the same beams, but completely independent collisions and then completely independent detector and measurements and principles and trigger software. And we agree well with them. So we basically have a built-in cross-check at the LHC to make sure we've done it right. So I think I'll end there with what is a very small fraction of the Atlas trigger group um, outside of our control room uh, with the Atlas detector 100 meters beneath us. And yeah, stop there for questions. Thank you very much, Heather. This, this, was, a, this was a great talk. I personally enjoyed it a lot. And uh, I just have to say that I myself has he have here a <laughs> So this was not the best. <laughs> so with the sprinkles. Okay, so whoop, let's get rid of that. <laughs> so this was really fun. I enjoyed it a lot. And I think we have a bunch of questions already. So I think it's a good time to start the Q&A session. So everybody, you still can ask some questions on Instagram or here in the chat on YouTube. And of course, you are always free to comment with the donut that I think is uh, the symbol of this talk, of this talk by, this, by, <laughs> by this point. <laughs> All right. So where do we start? Let's have a look at that. So let's ask these uh, questions, for example, just to, to give a little bit of a different angle. So why do some experiments not have a trigger system? This is one coming from Instagram. So can you tell us a little bit about that? So uh, as far as I know, all experiments have to have some sort of trigger system. They'll have some sort of data acquisition system. And even if they want to save every event, and this wouldn't be like LHC experiments, but for instance, maybe, and it's not my expertise, maybe some neutrino experiments, they want to save everything that happens. And the reason you would be in that situation is because the rate at which things happen is a rate at which you can actually record. So you don't need to filter events. Um, but also it could be that every single event is something super interesting. And that's not the situation we're in at, at Atlas, right? Most of the time, the protons <laughs> don't do anything particularly fun. <laughs> uh, I, I agree. Okay, that's a, that's a very good answer. And I think with this one, we can move to another one that is more Atlas specific. So Jordana is asking here in, in YouTube that you mentioned the Atlas trigger system that was designed 20 plus years ago. So what is the state of the art for triggering systems nowadays today? So what has been improved? What has been changed? Right, so I actually, the original system, yeah, was designed 20 years ago or more than that. And some of the original parts still exist. That's the, the limiting factor, actually the front end electronics, the things that, that actually save the data before we make that level one decision. Those are still some of the old electronics. Um, but some of the other stuff I described today, for instance, the, all the boards with the nice car copper spikes, which I think look awesome, um, <laughs> those are new. We haven't even used them yet in collisions. That's that's an upgrade to our system that's being, I think it's it's under in underground now. It's just been installed and we're testing them. So they'll they'll go online to select events next year when the LH, LHC restarts. Um, now, some of the other, or like the, the front end electronics themselves, for instance, um, yeah, they, they are old and they were state of the art at the time. Um, and that's not going to carry us forever. When we do uh, have you know, the LH, HL LHC, the high luminosity LHC, where there's even more protons colliding um, in each bunch and we're going to be totally overwhelmed with collisions, they won't be able to keep up. So we will be upgrading those um, in like 2025, 2026. So all of this stuff does get replaced. And for instance, the HLT farm, I said 100,000 cores in 2015 to 18, our last run, it was around 40,000, right? So it goes up and we, we definitely improve things as we go. But the, the way the system works is still generic, you know, basically the same as the original design. Good. And that was a great answer. So yeah, indeed, I mean, there is, uh, for the future, there will be very more improvements. All right, so another question from Instagram now. And the question is like, uh, can't CMS and Atlas use the same event selection system? It's an interesting question. <laughs> I mean, 
So the, the software we run is designed for the, you know, the, the Atlas detector. It's designed to take information from detector cells in a certain layout. But the principle behind it, if we fixed, if we changed all of the like the cable we expect to connect to this part of Atlas to change to like it's getting information from this part of the CMS, the principle behind it would work at both. And there's nothing fundamental there. Um, but and we generally don't want to do anything like that. We want to keep independent. We, we do our best, you know, not to, to copy each other because we want that independent cross-check. If we, if we see something new, we need to be able to, you know, have that, that cross-check of somebody else going, yeah, it's there or no. <laughs> I, I agree. But it's also more fun to try to figure oh. out different, different answers to the same question. Cool. Thanks so much for the answer. And then let's move to another question. So we can ask another one from Instagram. So the question is, what sort of software does the trigger run on? Uh, so this is the, the software I, I showed you that, you know, screenshot of our GitLab repository. It's, it's basically, I wish I meant to look up the number of lines of code. It's many, many, many lines of C++ is what it is. We, we have that, it's compiled, so it's like executables. And we can configure a few things with Python, but basically we're just running C++ like some games are made in the same software. It's just instead of having a, a visual, you know, graphical user interface that you can play around with, it's all behind the scenes and it just, you know, hits in and numbers out. Cool. All right. So that is again, a pretty good answer. And of course, appropriate for reality. So we have another question now, let's see from here, from, from YouTube. So it was uh, Andres that asks, how are particles identified from the data and what detector parameters are needed to calculate experimental variables? You already addressed a little bit of this, but maybe you can elaborate a bit more. Yeah, so let's talk about, I'll, I'll use one particle type of particle as an example, um, because I'm not gonna go through them all. It would take us an entire talk, but you get somebody else to talk about that. Um, but let's talk about electrons. So an electron, remember, when it travel, travels through the inner detector, um, there's lots of layers of we, or pixel detectors. They're basically like what's inside of, your, of a camera. And it says electron was here, electron was here, electron was here. So we get a whole bunch of space points that tell us that the charged particle went through. On top of that, it's inside of a solenoid. So it's a big magnet that because an electron is charged, that has a charge and it has uh, um, like a mass, right? it's going to curve. It's going, going fast and the magnetic field bends the particle. So we get a measurement of where it was. And then also the curvature tells us, because we know it's an electron, we know it's mass. It tells us um, how fast it was going. Then the electron hits the calorimeters. And the first few layers are what we call the electromagnetic calorimeter. And that's because they're specifically designed to measure the energy of electromagnetic type particles, that is electrons. So it, all the different layers absorb the energy. And it's not just one giant blob we get. We actually get lots of detailed information, both sort of longitudinally as it gets absorbed and horizontally in, in how big the extent of the shower of the particles is when it hits the, the detector. It's sort of all sorts of photons and electrons come out um, and gradually the particle gets slowed. And all of that information, the shape that that deposit of energy was in the calorimeter, plus the tracks curvature, and did it actually point to that <laughs> cluster of energy in the calorimeters tell us that basically we put that together and that looks like an electron. And that's what we you know, predict an electron would do in our calorimeter by simulating it. And that's, if we see that in data, we can go, yeah, that was, that was probably an electron. So I think this was a bit of, a, of an addition over what you already had presented in the talks. I hope this was enough. If not, Andres, there will be indeed more talks and we can get through that later. So very good. So let's go find another question. All right, so following a little bit on the question of the code before, from Instagram, we have a question that is, do you need to know a lot of coding to be a physicist? This is a loaded question. Um, it is. To become a physicist, no. You don't need to know. So when I started my PhD, I did not know how to code. I didn't know anything. I still, by uh, you know, metric of people who are actual software engineers, don't know how to code, right? I, I can't design fancy software packages that would be deployed in, for people paying money for them. But what we do is something very specific in scientific computing, right? We design code that needs to be readable by lots of people, and it needs to do its job and do its job fast. 
Um, so it's a slightly different type of coding. And this is something that you sort of learn as you, as you go along. Um, various people come in with various backgrounds or amount of training in their individual universities, but it's certainly not a prerequisite. Though if you're asking because you are a physicist and are you know, starting out or thinking about that and wanting to do this in the future, along the way, do take some courses because it, it will not hinder you. It, it will help for sure, but it's not mandatory by any means. So thanks so much. It's, uh, it's, I, I agree with the answer. I also myself didn't really know how to code well Fortran when I started my PhD and I, I don't use Fortran for anything today. <laughs> so, all right, cool. So let's go for a, just another question. Let's have a look. I mean, we are a little bit beyond the hour, but I think the talk was super exciting and we have a few questions. So let's, let's ask just a, a couple more. So especially one I think is, uh, is a really cool one. So from Instagram, they wanna know, Heather, if you do any analysis alongside your bigger work and if you wanna share it with us. Sure, yeah, so I, I, I said, I think at one point, what I look for are, are very rare standard model processes that we haven't observed yet. So these are things, for instance, like um, the simultaneous production of, of a W boson alongside two photons. And these are interesting because in the standard model, um, a lot of times you'll see you know, diagrams like the Higgs boson decays to two muons. Um, this is a fairly simple diagram as far as I'm concerned. Um, the ones I'm interested in are the simultaneous coupling of four vector bosons. That's like two W bosons and two photons interacting all at the same time. Um, so if you have like two Ws and two photons and rotate or squeeze that just a little, you can have a W in and a W and two photons out. And that's sort of the thing that I, that I look for. And I do that by, um, for instance, having events that are triggered with uh, something from a W, remember we don't see Ws in the detector and we only see the products. So in my case, I look for electrons and muons from that W and two photons. I have very specific triggers that are there to make sure that we select those types of events. That's pretty cool, pretty cool process to study. So that's nice, maybe for another talk. <laughs> this is really fun. Yeah. Okay, so another question, another question, sorry. So, so, so this one, uh, this may take a, a little bit of time, but uh, maybe not. So there is another question from Instagram that asks, why does the LHC collide so many particles if only a few are being saved? Right, so this is because, um, right, like I said, we collide these giant bunches of protons because most of the time, the things that that we want to study don't happen. Um, the, the processes that we really want to look at, like, for instance, we want to observe the Higgs boson decaying to two muons. This is something the standard model predicts. And we have, do not have enough instances of this happening in four years of data to, to be confident that that's happening yet. Um, so that says, that's, it just tells you a bit about how, how infrequently these collisions happen. And that's with these massive, um, bunches of protons colliding, 36 in, of them interacting each collision. And I'm just saying we're not, not saving those events because we didn't trigger on them well. We just, they just haven't happened. Um, so it's processes like, like that um, that we want to study. So that's why we need to collide as many protons as possible at the same time. Um, on top of that, I didn't really say it in the talk, so I'll say it now, is if we're, we want to search for new particles, right? All we know for some of these is that they haven't, we haven't seen them yet. Um, and, and maybe in previous data sets or other experiments. So that means that maybe they only happen once. In all of our data, there might be, all we can say, for instance, now is that we didn't see any, which means it happened less than once. But there could, they could have be that we just haven't collided enough protons yet to see them, right? So we need to collide even more, maybe more at the same time or take data for longer, either way. And colliding more at the same time to a certain extent is easier than colliding data for 40 years. Um, and only by doing that will we ever collide enough events to be able to see some of the very rare things, either that the standard model predicts or the, the very rare things that are predicted by theorists to explain things like dark matter. Well, this was a great answer. So thank you very much for that. And I, I know we are a little bit beyond our... our well, stuff. it's fine for me. It's a, but it is nice. <laughs> it's only noon for me, so... <laughs> That is a different. No, but I have a one last question that is very important. So think about it properly. All right. So what kind of donut would a SUSI particle be? It's interesting. So it's a kind of donut that's predicted. 
um, but not discovered yet. It's a kind of donut that's sort of symmetric to the donuts that exist, but also not the same. Um, now maybe going with a theme of like a W boson, so we have a W, we put Eno at the end. So it's like a wino, just kind of like a wino, which is kind of like wine. So maybe they're boozy donuts. <laughs> Something different that hasn't been invented, haven't, hasn't been seen yet. <laughs> At point, somebody has invented that, I'm sure, but yeah, it looks a little different, but it's kind of the same. So cool. Yeah, I, th I think that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good donut for sure. <laughs> All right, Helen. <laughs> So I think it's time for us to wrap up. I think this was fantastic. I had a great time. So thank you really very much for being our speaker today. It was really great. Thanks to everybody for joining here. I, I think we have like a very lively discussion in, in all of our social media. And of course, please comment with a donut if you have watched this live. <laughs> so thank you so much, really, Heather. So we will disconnect now yeah. and see you in the next um, live talk. So... Bye. Bye.